the Senate Finance Committee will come to order. Uh, members, we have a very special um, hearing this morning. We have the President of the Federal Reserve Bank, Minneapolis, Neil Kashkari here. Thank you so much, Mr. Kashkari, for coming. I am um, very excited about this. We've had this plan for a while, and, and um, it'll be interesting to see your perspective on, on some of your poli policy initiatives and where you see the economy in not necessarily our state, but the Midwest and up the area, the District 12 uh, that you serve. And uh, just members, you have, you have some information in your packets about some of the policy initiatives that the Federal Reserve Bank is, is focusing on. So I hope um, you have a chance to glance over those. I, they're, they're very in tune to the issues that we are facing here at the Capitol. And so um, I had a chance to talk with Mr. Kashkari for a few minutes before the hearing, and I, I have many more questions for you. So um, thank you for your insight and for your direction. And Mr. Kashkari, I'll, I'll open it up to you. Thank, thank you, you, Madam Chairman. Uh, and thank you, uh, all members of the committee, for inviting me here today. It's a great privilege for me to represent the Minneapolis Fed. I thought I would spend just a few moments on the background of the Minneapolis Fed, what we do, the work we do, and then talk about some of the policy issues that we're working on where I think there may be good opportunities for us to collaborate on that I think many of your constituents may be facing. So let me just start with the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is our nation's central bank. We were created by the U.S. Congress in 1913, and Congress has given us two goals. You might read about it. We talk about our dual mandate. One of our goals is stable prices. Think of an economy that's not overheating, but also not limping along, kind of steady growth. And then the second goal is maximum employment. As many Americans who want to work are able to find jobs. Now, if you go back in time, actually Alexander Hamilton created the first central bank of the United States. It was called the Bank of the United States and it lasted about 20 years. And then they got rid of it because it just sounded undemocratic. A central bank in a democracy, what are, what are they up to? It just sounded a little curious. Then there was a second bank of the United States and then they got rid of that. And then our economy was hammered with banking panics in the late 1800s, especially the ag sector. And there was a really big one, the banking panic of 1907. And that's when Congress in Washington said, you know what, even though we're not crazy about having a central bank, we need to have one. But here's what's important about the Minneapolis Fed. We don't want it all to be concentrated in Washington, D.C. We want to spread it out around the country so that the different regions of the country are directly represented in monetary policy making. So they created the Board of Governors in Washington, D.C and they created 12 independent regional Federal Reserve Banks, the ninth of which is the Minneapolis Fed. So our jobs at the Minneapolis Fed are literally to represent you and to represent all of our constituents in Minnesota, North and South Dakota, Montana, the Upper Peninsula of Michigan, and Northwestern Wisconsin. So a lot of my time I spend with my colleagues traveling around our region, hearing from workers, businesses, local leaders about what's happening in our regional economy. And then when I go back to Washington, D.C., every six weeks for FOMC meetings, Federal Open Market Committee, I bring that information back to Washington and put that into the policy process so that when we deliberate on economic policy and monetary policy for the whole nation, our region is directly represented in that deliberation. And so that's why I just wanted you to know why do we have a Minneapolis Fed at all? It's literally to represent this region and make sure that this region is part of the policymaking process in Washington, D.C. So at the Minneapolis Fed, we have about 1,000 employees. We obviously do a lot of economic research. We've got a world-class economic research department. We do research on the regional economy, the national and global economy. We also have bank supervisors that visit banks all across our district and regulate those banks to make sure that they're operating in a safe and sound capacity. We provide a lot of services to the financial system. So for example, when banks wire money to each other and transact, the Federal Reserve provides a lot of the backbone behind that system. We also provide cash to all of us. So if you go to the ATM and you take out money from your account, that money started out in the vault at the Minneapolis Fed. So there are a bunch of different services that we provide with our 1,000 employees to help the economy continue to function. Think about the plumbing and the basic operations of our economic system. So with that, let me just talk for a few moments about some of the policy issues that we work on that we think are really tied to our maximum employment mandate. As you probably know, the Minneapolis Fed for many years has done a lot of work on early childhood development. 
and the value, the economic return of investing in early education. We continue to work in that area. We continue to think it's important. There's no bigger determinant of a labor market outcome than education. So education is very, very important from our perspective as it relates to the job market and achieving maximum employment. We're doing some work on K through 12. We're doing work looking at higher ed as well. How do we educate as many Americans as possible given the resource constraints that we have as a country? So education is a big one. Uh, affordable housing is another big one that we're doing a bunch of work on now. Everywhere that I go in our district, in our region, red, red area or blue district, affordable housing is becoming an increasing challenge. And we're trying to understand why isn't the private market able to step in and build units, build more apartments, build more homes that people can afford. We need the, we, my view is we need the private market to move in this direction to meet the scale of the needs across our communities. So affordable housing is a big area. And I think Minneapolis has taken an important step forward in trying to focus on how do we improve density we do think that density has a role to play in tackling this. It's not the, it can't solve everything, but we do think more private market supply is gonna be part of the solution. So this is an area of big focus for us. Uh, Childcare is another area we're starting to do more work on. Uh, I was, uh, the chairwoman and I were just chatting that I'm a new father, so I am now in the childcare market myself and uh, very interested in the dynamics. This is a very complicated market where you have families across our region frustrated that they can't find affordable childcare. And yet I always ask our economists, why are wages for childcare providers so low? Something is broken if those two things are true at the same time. You would think if there was a real shortage of supply, wages would be high, yet wages are low. So what's going on? And I wish I was here today to give you a definitive answer. I don't know yet, but this is something that we're working on. And I know from the chairwoman that this is something that's very interesting to you. And this is, could be something that we work on together. A few other topics I will tick through. Uh, immigration. Uh, if you look at our country, we're having fewer kids than we had in prior generations. And a big source of economic growth is simply population growth. More workers to produce things, more consumers to buy things. And if our population growth is slowing because we're having fewer kids, where's our economic growth gonna come from? Well, immigration has been a big driver of economic growth for America for the last several decades, for our, throughout our history, frankly. And the question is, what role can it play going forward? If you look, other countries are facing this too. Japan has very low fertility, yet culturally they're very resistant to immigration. So they are trying to subsidize fertility. They're literally trying to offer tax credits and financial incentives to encourage Japanese families to have more babies. Let me tell you, it takes 20 years to grow a new worker, right? That's not a fast solution if it's even possible. And so what role can immigration play in economic growth for this region and for the country going forward? Another topic that we're very interested in. And then two other topics, then I will turn it back over to the chairwoman. Uh, one is just we're looking at disparities. I came to Minnesota three years ago. This is a remarkable state. We have a very diverse economy. On average, we have very good schools and an educated workforce. I was surprised to learn that Minnesota has some of the biggest disparities in the country. Regional disparities, also racial disparities. So I asked our economists, why do these disparities exist? Why are they so persistent? And I'll be honest with you, I didn't get very good answers. So we launched a new research initiative, a long-term research initiative, to take advantage of the Federal Reserve's economic research capability to try to focus on unpacking these disparities and figuring out what are sensible solutions that can really make a difference over the long term. We just hired a new uh, professor from Notre Dame University, uh, Abigail Wozniak, who's now moved to Minnesota to lead this effort for us. It's a major long-term commitment for the Minneapolis Fed to get at these disparities. And then I'll just mention Indian country. For several years, we've had a center focused on uh, Indian country economic outcomes. Huge gaps, as you all know, on tribal, uh, on reservations, uh, education gaps, workforce gaps, safety, trying to unravel what can we do to try to close some of these gaps and give folks growing up there a better opportunity in the future. So again, another long-term research initiative for us. Um, and there's more. So we are here, we love our region, we're committed to it. Uh, I think the number one hallmark of people who work at the Federal Reserve is a commitment to public service. We think public service really matters. And if you take anything away from this hearing, I hope you will take away confidence in the Federal Reserve Bank of Minneapolis and that view us as a partner in wanting to get at 
some of these underlying issues that our state and our region are facing. We know that monetary policy can't solve many of the problems that I just talked about, but we feel like we have a contribution to make if we can help do some of the research and then arm you with the data and analysis you need to then take it forward and consider possible fiscal solutions. So thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and thank you to the members of the committee for having me today. Thank you very much, Mr. Kashgari. That was um, very good. And <clears throat> I, I am interested in your Opportunity and Inclusive Growth Institute. Uh, can you explain just a little bit about that? That's your, uh, to promote greater economic equity? Yeah, so that's the, when I, that was what I was just speaking about, where I was surprised by the disparities that we have okay. in our state. And, you know, the Federal Reserve hires more PhD economists, I believe, than any institution in the world. And they do research on a wide range of topics. So the idea was, how do we get some of this brain power focused on unpacking these disparities? We know part of it is from education. We know there are wealth disparities. We know there are, you know, they're related to housing. It's related to health care. These are multifaceted. But what are, what does the analysis show the best way to make a difference? to close some of these gaps, to create economic opportunity for everybody. And so I, I wish I were here today to tell you here we found the solution. These problems are decades or longer in the making. But the point is we at the Minneapolis Fed have a focused effort to do our part to try to unravel these gaps. And one of the exciting things about our institute, we're bringing in scholars from around the world to Minnesota to work with us in residence, partner with us to try to crack, to get a crack at this. Is um, Minneapolis unique to doing this research? There are the other, <clears throat> we're unique in the organized way we've approached it. So this is a, these are topics that other Federal Reserve banks have a few researchers here, a few researchers there doing important work on, but this is the first very organized effort to say let's create an institute solely focused on this that can tap into the expertise around the Federal Reserve system. So it's more of a focused approach. Well, I know um, it, the past president was very focused on early childhood, and we used that research quite a bit. I'm hoping that um, the, the issues that you mentioned are, are in the forefront of the issues that we're facing. So I'm hoping we will be able to see you here more often um, and tap into that research of results, which you have found, because we are desperate for um, movement in these areas. They are absolutely um, stymieing our economy. And I know, I perhaps stole this from George Will, that it's the ag economy, energy policy, and health care policy drive a nation, drive a state. And I, I still believe that. And uh, your ninth district really fits well into that with the ag and the energy. And um, it's, I don't know if you have any comments about about that, the healthcare policy that we've been working through since 2010. Well, these are, those are huge sectors of the U.S. economy. And one of the things that's exciting for me, representing the 9th Federal Reserve District, is all major sectors of the U.S. economy are represented here. Right. Now, that serves us well because we have a diversified economy, so ag is suffering from low prices, but other parts of the economy are doing better. So that diversity, but it also presents those same challenges. And so I think you hit it. Those are really big, important sectors uh, that we pay attention to to try to understand what's happening. Oh, absolutely. Uh, Senator Kipmer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. Kashkari, this is just such a treat. I was talking to my husband this morning. He was just thrilled that you were going to be here today and that I would get to hear you personally. So uh, good news for that. Um, I wanted to make a few comments about things in response to some of the things that you brought up and then get your response to them as well. The first one was on education, which no out question, and from the founding of our country, education has been a very important thing. And noticing these gaps, in my district, we have a graduation rate of about 95% on a four-year. If you go to a seven-year, which Minnesota allows to the age of 21, they get up to 98, 99. I just, I would like to mention that, let's study also where it works and why does it work, not just where it doesn't and why doesn't it, because we want to have success and then see what that does. One of the things that I, I have found and noticed in my district is the strength of our family structures overall in my district. Children come to school with breakfast for the most part, they come supported, encouraged, and they generally have a mom and a dad in their homes and, and they're working um, generally well. 
and that that has an effect on the schools as well. We, we see those things having an effect. Recently in my committee, I serve in Health and Human Services on both committees, um, we had testimony from a, a tribal uh, counselor mentioning of getting upstream early and that if you start dealing with problems way down here, you've got to get up. What helps to strengthen them? And they've had some really great success in the White Earth Nation. And I would suggest maybe chatting with again. And they've had success at working with moms and others as well that I think might be a helpful direction to my theme of where success and go look like it. In the area of affordable housing, I've carried uh, legislation, worked with uh, Builders Association, we're forming a legislative commission uh, on affordable housing, and it is really important uh, to that. But one of the things you hear over again is the uh, excessive regulations that drive up the price and also keep us from having the market and the strength of home ownership attachment to the community building wealth for the future, opportunities, uh, commitment to their communities, just provides a lot. So it's not just a house, it's a home. In the child care area, why is the demand high and the wages low? Mainly because parents can only afford so much. But in addition, I am carrying many bills on helping to lift the regulatory burden, again, on family child care providers. In a rural Minnesota, 85% are in-home family child care providers. You keep siblings together, you have continuity of care, and it is the most inexpensive and yet very successful for these largely women-owned small businesses, and that's what they do. Um, I think the disparities are really important, and one of the things that has bothered me for a while when we talk about gaps, but I also see in many of these situations there's a gap in fatherhood. In the, and I think many times the value of the women and what they provide without question. But sometimes missed in all that is the value of the fathers, especially to the young boys at having a role model, at having, uh, I've, I've raised, my husband and I have raised three boys. And believe me, one boy in the house, it's pretty peaceful. Two boys in the house, we get the, you get three boys in the house and they're snapping dish towels and the joshing and stuff. And it's constructive and helpful, but it's always especially helpful when dad walks in the room and says, hey boys, settle down, go outside and do a rough housing, not inside. Those are constructive things that don't um, denigrate uh, who they are and what they are, and the same thing with our young ladies as well. I've kind of glanced over a variety of things, but the main thing is to give you then the opportunity to maybe uh, to give input, but also um, I'd appreciate your comments in, in those areas. Mr. Kashkari, uh, Senator Kiffmeyer has done a tremendous amount of work on the child care issue. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chairwoman and Senator, for your questions. Uh, let me just say, focusing on what Here. works, I, amen. Uh, one of the exciting things for me about education is that we have a 50-state laboratory of states that are trying different things and communities that are trying different things. And some of those things are working and some of those things aren't working. And so what I've challenged our team is to look nationally at where our cities making progress, what, is, what are the keys to success, and let's see what we can replicate without, without suggesting a heavy hand of one size fits all for all communities. So I absolutely agree with focus on what works and what can we learn from that. We don't want to break something that's working well. We want to help those who need the help while keeping those who are having success, making sure that they stay successful. And I think that that's true for education and it goes across a range of different issues. Just turning br very briefly to the affordable housing topic, I'll give you an, an anecdote of good intentions but that can have bad consequences or unintended consequences. California recently passed a law I read about where they mandated solar panels on every new home. Good intention in terms of we want to be good stewards of the environment. Allegedly that increases the average cost of a home by $10,000. That is a direct impact to affordability for low income families. And so sometimes we have very different public policy goals that can work at cross purposes with each other. I'm not here to tell you that solar panels are a good idea or a bad idea. I'm here to say that I think that all of us should do rigorous analysis to say what are the real consequences of these proposals that we put forward. So when you talk about regulations, whether it's for childcare or for housing, each of those regulations was probably had good intentions underneath it. 
But when you look at it and you put them all together, we have to look at what the overall effects are. Is it helping families or is it making the problem worse? Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Senator Nelson. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, President Kashkari, it is wonderful to have you here today. And uh, I so appreciate uh, your leadership and your um, really grabbing hold of something that um, I also believe is so incredibly important, and that is education. It truly is the great equalizer. And I appreciate the fact that you um, are embarking and continuing really what Minnesota has done. We've, we have been a leader in uh, early education models uh, and we do, uh, your predecessor has started that discussion and now I'm thrilled that uh, you are continuing that discussion. Um, and I would just add that we do have that Minnesota model now uh, that is based upon what happened right here with the Federal Reserve really taking the lead uh, over a decade ago and really pointing out the importance of that early education and um, it is, I do believe that education really uh, is that moral issue of our day. Uh, it, it's the racial issue of our day. And quite frankly, as we're seeing, it's the economic issue of our day. Uh, and so uh, I look forward to uh, your work uh, in that area. Um, and, and I also wanted to just add uh, two other things be, be beyond that er those early years that are so important, uh, and we can talk more about that at another time, but also on the uh, latter end of the education spectrum, that K-12 spectrum, something else we've seen that actually works uh, very well is in closing our persistent achievement gap, and that is dual enrollment, uh, whether it be uh, PSEO, college in the schools, uh, CTE, all of those things have really uh, increased uh, graduation rates by double digits uh, in uh, various uh, segments of, uh, low of typically lower performing students. So those are things I hope we can uh, continue on as well. I wanted to uh, ask uh, for some comments on our tight labor market. That was very concerning to me to see that um, our economic growth in our recently updated forecast uh, was one of the reasons that we saw this 30% uh, reduction in anticipated um, budget surplus, uh, as I understand it, was that the tight labor market is really constraining economic growth. And uh, some of the other things are uh, perhaps outside of our control that had uh, impacts on the uh, reduced uh, a budget forecast, but it's this um, constraint on economic growth due to the tight labor market. And I'm wondering if you could speak a little bit to that. Um, and. Uh, my, one of part of my district is the city of Rochester. So the Destination Medical Center has been a huge has paid a, a huge impact in uh, economic growth. And as as you kind of address that um, tight labor market, if you might also tell me a little bit about are there other states that have embraced the uh, private. Uh, partnership, private-public uh, partnership that really started fueling that uh, massive economic growth in Rochester. Mr. Kashkari. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for your, question, your comments and your question. The, assessing the labor market uh, is enormously important to the work that we do every day at the Federal Reserve because we're trying to figure out is the U.S. economy growing at potential, above potential, below potential? That directly affects how we think about where interest rates should be set. Because if we think the economy is growing slowly, we will typically cut rates to try to boost it. Or if we think the economy is overheating, we will raise rates to try to cool it down. So I have been in the camp that I don't think we are yet at maximum employment. I hear anecdotes every day from businesses saying, oh my gosh, it's a worker shortage, what are we gonna do? And then I always ask them the next question, well, are you raising wages? And usually the answer is no. We are seeing some wage growth now, especially at the low end, entry level workers, their wages are growing more quickly. But we've been amazed in the last few years how many Americans have come off the sidelines who, you know, we do these surveys, the federal government does these surveys, and they ask people, are you, do you have a job? Would you like a job? And a lot of people say, no, I would not like a job for whatever reason, I'm not in the labor force. So they're not counted as unemployed. Mm -hmm. So what we've seen over the past few years is literally millions of people have come off the sidelines across the country who previously said they were not interested in working and are now taking jobs. So the question for all of us is, how many more are out there? The, the US job market is still not as strong as it was 
back in 2000. So there are many different measures that we look at. Uh, I'm of the view that I think there is still slack in the labor market, and until we see wage growth really pick up, I'm going to believe that there's still more Americans out there. Now, that's a national view. Locally, it's very different. Every, every community can be very different. I've heard anecdotes from Rochester, how tight it is there, et cetera. Local areas can boom. But again, people in, in America tend to move to good opportunities. So when there was a robust oil boom in North Dakota, people flocked from all across the country to North Dakota because there were high wages that attracted them there. And so what I would just ask you, if you look at Destination Medical Center or the Rochester area, what's happening to wages? If wages are really picking up, my guess is you're going to be able to attract people from around the state or around the region to want to come and take those jobs. So I'm very focused on wages as the best indicator of overall how tight is the labor force. Um, no, yes, Senator Nelson. Uh, just a quick follow-up. Um, do you have an idea on uh, w one segment that I've uh, been kind of somewhat concerned about is, you know, that that uh, those cohorts of kids that graduated from uh, post-secondary, whether it was college and career or, or four-year university, uh, in the midst of the Great Recession. And I'm just contemplating, you know, we have, I think, a large, maybe one of the largest percent percentages of Americans in general, maybe Minnesotans too, that are uh, not in the labor market um, and uh, that are in the, the that workforce age. And I'm just wondering if part of that might be this cohort of kids that graduated uh, or tried to enter the labor market in the midst of the Great Recession and how is that uh, playing out for those kids as far as uh, getting jobs or moving up and have, has there been any um, study on that and how to, then on a broader sense, how to, why are, why are more Minnesotans or Americans not in the labor market as in the past? What is keeping uh, our people from, our working age people from wanting to be in that labor market? Mr. Kishkar. Madam Chair, Senator, uh, this is a, a great question that a lot of researchers are focusing on. We do know a few things. We do know that when you graduate from whatever your, the end of your edu formal education is, the, the economic conditions at that time really matter a lot. Mm -hmm. It matters on what path you're put on, what trajectory you're put on. Do you have a, a good outlook or a, more of a struggle? And those, those tend to last, even if the economy recovers. If you started out in a bad spot, it tends to take a while to work those effects off. So I think you're right that that's part of it. We also know that opioids is part of it. Opioids are keeping Americans on the sidelines and not participating, or drug issues more broadly beyond just opioids meth, et cetera. Uh, there's also disability. One of the big positives, you know, the narrative of economic experts a few years ago was that once you're on disability, you're lost from the labor market for good. We've remarkably seen that turn around in the last couple of years, where a lot of people who previously said, I'm, on disab I'm disabled, I can't work, are now saying, you know what, I'm going to go get that job, because wages are starting to tick up. So we don't know for sure why so many people are still out of the labor force. There are a lot of these different issues. We do know that it's affecting men more than it's affecting women. And I'm hoping that if we can keep the economy growing, keep the job market getting stronger, that we're gonna draw these folks back in. And once we get them back in and hopefully reattach to the labor force, boy, it's not just good for them and their families, it's good for all of us. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Senator Westrom and then Senator Cohen. Thank you, Madam uh, Chair and uh, Mr. Katzkari. Uh, uh, Chair of the Ag Committee, uh, Housing Development, or Rural Development and Housing Finance here in uh, the Senate. And so uh, lots of areas I'd like to go with you. I think you've uh, covered some of them uh, eloquently. But agriculture, uh, let's focus on agriculture. Just from what you're seeing, uh, we uh, certainly know the commodity prices have been uh, depressed or low for several years now uh, after uh, coming out of about a 10-year uh, fairly strong cycle. Um, but what are you seeing from the Federal Reserve and the economics that you see in the whole upper Midwest? Uh, I'm guessing it's quite similar to what we're hearing, but I'd just uh, be interested in your perspective of agriculture and uh, the effects uh, it may have on the economy or the effects it does have on the economy and um, just just your observations 
uh, on that sector because it's such a big part of Minnesota and, and certainly, as you mentioned earlier, a key sector in our economy. Mr. Kashgar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. Yes, uh, we hear the same things that you're hearing. A lot of concerns from farmers themselves, uh, also from banks that lend to those farmers as those farmers are under stress because of years and years of low prices. Uh, over the course of the last year, we heard a lot more concern about the tariffs as kind of adding pressure to farmers that were already suffering from low prices and would that exacerbate the challenges that they're having. Our analysis says, unfortunately, there doesn't seem to be an easy solution to this. Most of our analysis suggests that these low prices are being driven by ample production. Very productive farmers having continued record year after record year when a lot of farmers are very, very productive, there's a lot of supply and that pushes down prices and that obviously puts pressure on the tends to be the smaller farmers or the least efficient farmers, et cetera. So we, we've done some analysis. One of my colleagues is here on bankruptcies in the ag sector, how they are climbing now because of these low prices that have sustained for several years. Uh, but beyond that, it's an important sector. We spent a lot of time looking at it. Uh, it seems like it's fundamentals from supply and demand, but it is something that we continue to pay a lot of attention to, but we don't have a good solution for. And Senator Weston. And to that, um, Madam Chair, uh, uh, to drill down a little deeper, the bankruptcies you mentioned, uh, what, what is the landscape or what do you foresee as far as uh, you, your, your line of work deals with credit and uh, operating loans and uh, bankruptcies, potentially um, foreclosures? Are, are we seeing upticks in that or is uh, there enough restructuring of debt and uh, ways to uh, uh, get liquidate maybe in some cases. I know some scenarios, uh, you know, generally land prices have kept kept to their value. Uh, in the 80s, that wasn't the case. Uh, that, that collapsed with high interest and it seemed to be a different recipe with the farm crisis of the 80s. Or do we have the same markers coming along uh, that, that we're maybe not seeing yet? Or would you say we're, we have some different uh, indicators right now or different uh, pieces of the puzzle or are we maybe uh, just not far enough along and the, the 1980s could be repeated. Um, I, I hear both sides uh, analyzing that and uh, many seem to think we don't have the same same scenario or setup as the 80s but uh, I'd be interested in your observation just as the overall foreclosures, bankruptcy, credit, etc. cetera. President Gankar, Thank you, Madam Chair. Senator, I think you're right. We are seeing upticks in bankruptcies and foreclosures and restructurings. We meet with a lot of banks. Most banks that I meet with will say, oh, we, we learned our lesson in the 80s and we're not repeating the same mistakes that we made back then. But then they always say it's my competitor who's doing it. And so if they're all saying it, it gives me some, uh, I don't take them quite at their, at their word that they're not repeating some of the bad behavior. Generally speaking, we don't see an ag collapse on the horizon. I don't see any indication that that's coming, that we're gonna have a repeat of the 1980s. Most people that we talk to and our economists as they look at it, the question is how many years are these low prices going to persist? At some point there has to be an adjustment. At some point you would think if low prices persist, low, low commodity prices persist long enough, then you would see ag values adjusting to reflect those prices. So right. I, I'm not seeing that on the near in the near term, but. Obviously, I also can't rule it out. It seems like what's happening right now is more at a local level, one-off farm, one-off bank. It's very painful for that farmer and for that family, but we're not seeing an overall effect on the Minnesota economy being brought down as a result of it because the other sectors of our economy are doing well right now. Very good, thank you. And uh, Madam Chair, Senator uh, Western. If, if I can, uh, do you have quite a list? Senator oh, Western, if I could ask, and I'm asking Senator Cohen to let Senator okay. Newman go next. Yes, because he that'd has be a fine. bill signing <laughs> at 9.30 with the governor. So yep. um, I'll, I'll come back. I'll uh, if you can put me at the bottom of the list, that'd be fine. Thank you. Senator Newman. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members. Uh, uh, real quick question, I, I believe. You've mentioned a couple of times that uh, increasing wages is an important component of improving the U.S. economy. Uh, what are your thoughts on government mandated wage increases versus allowing the private sector to resolve that issue? Mr. 
Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for the question. This is actually a topic which I should have mentioned early on that we're doing research on at the Minneapolis Fed. So when the city of Minneapolis adopted its new higher minimum wage, $15 an hour minimum wage ordinance, they requested researchers submit proposals to study the effects of it. And we volunteered to study the effects of it over eight years to just do the honest analysis. Is this good for workers? Is it good for businesses? Is it good for the economy as a whole? And we've committed to do the analysis honestly and transparently and make it public so that legislators like yourselves can take those facts and draw what conclusions you wanna draw from it. At a big picture, so I don't wanna prejudge the conclusions, but at a big picture, as with most policies, there are winners and losers. So if you raise minimum wage, as an example, uh, that's very good for workers who keep their jobs but it's very painful for workers who lose their jobs if there, are, if there are job losses that result from it. I think the fact that the overall economy is strong and the overall job market is strong probably means that trade-off, there are gonna be fewer losers than there would, be, would have been if we were starting at a place of high unemployment. So if you're starting from a place of low unemployment, that trade-off is probably lower than if you were starting at a place of high unemployment. But some, researchers, some research has shown that some cities have raised the minimum wage and that businesses have had to cut hours. So the take home pay actually doesn't necessarily go up for the workers whose, dollar, whose salary went up. So it's a complicated issue. I mean, my first best uh, recommendation is if we can get the economy strong enough that wages are growing across the board because of market forces, that's good for everybody. There are no winners and losers. It's just winners if wages are going up that way. But if you have a government intervention, a government mandate, then I think there are trade-offs that we need to be honest about, and that's the work that we're committed to doing. But I can't give you a more definitive answer than that at this point, sir. Senator Newman. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you for that answer. Just one quick follow-up. Uh, uh, can you give us any idea as to when the research on this issue is going to be completed so that we as legislatures or legislators uh, can take a look at it and, and it help us in developing our policies. And to that, um, Senator Newman, I do want to ask Mr. Kashkari too, how will you be interacting with us with this information um, in a timely manner uh, uh, when things are complete? Would like to, to develop that, that uh, correspondence and relationship. Yes, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Senator, for the, for the question. This is something we're gonna have Later this year, we're gonna have public conferences where we're bringing in experts from around the country. Uh, we have to work, we actually are gonna need your help. We have to work with the state government to get data, access to data, confidential data, to make sure that we can do ro robust, rigorous analysis. So we may, we may be coming to you asking actually for the legislature's help in making sure we can get access to the data that we need. It's an overall, it's an eight year study, but we're gonna have interim releases of analysis as we get data, we draw early conclusions, and we're gonna be making those public. And if the committee would like us to come and testify and present the results to you, we would be very pleased to do that. The point of this whole work is to give you the data that you need to make the best legislative decisions you can. So we're here to try to support your work, and we're gonna do that in any way that we possibly can. It's kinda of like the OLA on steroids. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Senator Newman. Thank you, Senator Westrom, for your patience, and Senator Cohen. Senator Westrom? Do you have further questions? Senator Cohen wants to go first, that's okay. fine. Okay, Senator Cohen. Okay, Madam Chair, thanks, thanks uh, Senator Westrom. Um, Mr. Kashkari, the, the chair uh, took part of my, my first question, which is um, over the years I've been here, I've, I've followed some of the work of the Fed from a distance. Um, the chair and I both had the opportunity to uh, observe the uh, Council of Economic Advisors and and uh, you know, the, uh, usually the senior VP and chief economist has been a member of the council. But you indicated that the ninth is somewhat ahead of the national curve in trying to integrate what has been, I think, the customary view of the Fed in terms of monetary policy with what's going on in terms of a, a state and a regional economy. And so just to follow up on, on the chair's comment, um, where I think I'm hearing this for the first time, um, have you, determined, you talked about coming in front of this committee and, and, and so on, but have you talked internally about a more careful dissemination of what you're doing? Because obviously uh, with uh, what you have at, uh, at your access in terms of, of the Fed uh, and the information, recommendations, informa everything you can convey to us could make a significant difference in how we make our judgments. So is, is there, this, so this question is a little bit more utilitarian. 
have you thought about the dissemination as opposed to just kind of, you know, could we appear in front of the committee occasionally? Mr. Kashgar. Well, we, we work very hard and we're always open to new ideas to try to get our research out to the public so that the public can benefit from it. It doesn't do us any good or anybody any good if we come up with good analysis and nobody knows about it. So we're always looking for ways. I'm not sure if I'm answering your question, so if I'm not, please follow up. We're always looking for ways to get our analysis out into the public, whether it's through social media, through public conferences. I go around our district, I give town hall discussions, I live stream them on the web, so anybody in the world who's interested could follow along. So. I guess I'm open to suggestions if there are other things we could be doing to be valuable to you, because at the end of the day, we want to be. And, and, and Madam Chair, maybe it's a, a conversation for another day, but uh, um, we get access to a lot of information, and, and, and a concern I have is that this, is, this has nothing to do with the Fed, and it's, a, it's not necessarily a complaint, but it's an observation about this place, irrespective of uh, which party is in the majority, that you know, we tend to take more of the short view in this place, and when we get uh, information of, of a magnitude that we should pay closer attention to, does it kind of get lost in the shuffle of our, our day to day work? So it's, it sounds like you're giving some thought to, to how to convey this and be uh, maybe not a partner necessarily with state legislatures in, in the district, but, uh, but maybe some, some thought to that. And, and Madam Chair, so let me ask a more direct uh, question. Um, if you could, uh, Sir Nelson talked about. Uh, the, the productivity concerns. Um, if, if you were to cite what you consider to be, would it be short-term, long-term, uh, the most significant two or three problems in terms of growth of the economy, both at a, at a federal and a state level over the next several years, what would they be? And uh, maybe, maybe this uh, lends itself to too long of an answer, uh, but what could we do then relative to that? Mr. Kishore. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I, I would say two things would jump out to me. Number one is workforce growth. And this is what I mentioned earlier, just as a country, all advanced economies, France, the United Kingdom, Japan, Germany, our populations are growing more slowly. We're all having fewer kids. And a big source of economic growth is simply population growth. So I would say respectfully that immigration, I mean, you have two choices, you have three choices. You can either accept slower growth you can turn to immigration or you can try to subsidize fertility. And that's just the math. Of those three, if it were up to me, I would say immigration is a huge competitive uh, strength for America if we design an immigration policy to feed the needs of our economy. So the workforce growth related to immigration is one thing I would point to. And then the second, which we already talked about a little bit, is education. Making sure, and it doesn't mean four-year degree for every American kid but it means equipping young people with the skills they need to be productive members of our economy and of our workforce. And I think of those two things, if I were to pick two, those are the two things that I would focus on. That would be huge drivers of growth for America, but also huge drivers of growth for Minnesota. And one of the, one of the nice things about having 50 states is we get to compete with other states. And so if we get our policies competitive here, people will have and will continue to flock to Minnesota, and that'll be a big source of economic growth for Minnesota. Mr. Cohen, or Senator Cohen, excuse me. So that raises the question, uh, Madam Chair, Mr. Kishkari. Um, we've had an emphasis, certainly on our early childhood, you've, you've emphasized that, and obviously uh, uh, preceding yourself uh, and other uh, folks at the Minneapolis Fed, um, Mr. Rolnick you know, was, was certainly uh, the early voice relative to early childhood. Um, you've talked about K-12, but where does higher education fit in? Um, it, it seems to me, at least in Minnesota, we've put a little bit of diminishment on, on higher education. So I'm, I'm wondering where, where that fits into the, uh, the structure. Mr. Kashkari. Uh, Madam Chair, Senator, I, higher education is, again, enormously important. It's only going to be more important in the future as our economy continues to become more technology-oriented, more knowledge-driven, the returns to higher education are more and more important and are greater. Again, that doesn't mean necessarily a four-year degree for everybody, but it means that the vast majority of Minnesota kids are probably going to need some type of education beyond just high school, whether it's a certificate, a two-year degree, or whatnot. And so creating greater pathways, greater access, you know, there are all sorts of barriers. I, I shared with the chairwoman before the hearing 
I visit, when I travel around, I visit a lot of community colleges and colleges, and I asked this president of a community college, I said, what's your most in-demand course? And he said it was radiology technician. I said, well, that's a great job. Why don't you train more of them? He said, well, the national accreditation body limits the number of seats because they want to limit supply to keep wages up. They won't allow us to expand our program. There are a hundred examples like that of artificial barriers keeping people away from getting the education that they want and that we would all benefit from if they got it. And so I think if we are really focused on breaking down some of those barriers, we can educate more people and I think we'll all be better off for it. Senator, Cohen, uh, Senator Champion has a uh, comment to this point. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Mr. President, uh, thank you for being here and I've been listening intensely to your comments and I was in, uh, uh, inspired by your talk about the opportunities in, 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 in inclusion growth that focus on disparities and the research that you are looking at doing to re really come up with focusing on disparities and also look at what I believe you said were sensible solutions. And then my good friend, uh, Chair, uh, 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 Senator Co uh, Cohen, asked you a very important question and I listened for your answer. Uh, you, uh, he asked you if you had to, to identify two or three uh, big points that would be important for us to take away and to help address some of these issues. Your first point was workforce growth and you talked about, because earlier you talked about the, how um, baby boomers, for an example, are going, are transitioning out of the labor force, people having less kids, and and you said if there were a number of different people who were sitting on the sidelines that are not engaged. But when you gave your answer around workforce growth, you immediately went to immigration. Um, and what, and why I'd like for you to speak to that question is because again, it seems as if you're falling into the same challenge um, that others have, which is you look past those who are sitting on the sidelines, African Americans for an example, Native Americans for an example, all those other American born individuals who are on the sideline, and you went immediately to immigration which creates what seems to be some time a challenge around the, the, the immigration community and other American born communities because they look, they are looked past and so that causes me some trepidation. So I'd like to know how do you reconcile those two notions? Uh, and, and, and if you see immigration as being the driver and the fix, fixer uh, to the overall challenge, then, then how is it that you see the value of digging deeper into your opportunities in, in, in inclusion growth how do you look deeper into your research and initiatives to really focus on and really understand exactly what's going on in, in those communities and those who are sitting on the sideline? And much more importantly, I'd like to hear also how those initiatives are gonna to talk to people like me or those who are in the communities that I represent because it says inclusive, so that means you have to include me but usually people don't include us when they come up with these notions as to how to address the concerns that I have. Now that's a convoluted notion that I've put forth, but I hope that you can make sense of, of what I just said. And I'd like to hear how you can reconcile those two notions because I think you have just fallen into the same challenge. Mr. Kashgar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator, for your very thoughtful question. Uh, I don't see any conflict I'll tell you why, because I said two things when I was asked what should we do to drive the economy. One is I said immigration, but second I said education. And education is about giving all Americans, all Minnesotans, the skills and the tools that they need to take advantage, to realize their full potential and participate fully in the economy. And so most of the educational work that we're focused on is about making sure that all Minnesotans, and in particular, Minnesotans in low-income communities and Minnesotans in communities of color, which if you look at the data, 
are not getting, on average, the same education as other communities, making sure that they have the skills. So respectfully, I don't see any tension at all. And the whole point of our Opportunity Inclusive Growth Institute is to reach those folks who are on the sidelines today and to find ways of bringing them in for their own sake, but for all of our sake. Because every person that we bring in off the sideline, give them skills, they get a good job, they become contributing members of Minnesota, and that's good for all of us. Now, to your very important question of how we engage with you and with members in your community that you represent, I would ask you, and we can send it to you offline, we have a number of different advisory boards on our institute. We have a community advisory board made up of community leaders from across diverse communities around Minnesota and around our region who are doing work on the ground in these communities every day. Because at the end of the day, the whole point of this is to come up with policy recommendations that are useful, that will actually make a difference on the ground in these communities. So our advisors are the ones who are giving us feedback. Hey, you're on the right track here, or no, you're missing something here. Because if it's not useful to them, then we're just wasting our time. And at the end of the day, we want to close these gaps, and they are a key partner for us. And I hope you would become a key partner for us in making sure we're focused on the right issues. Senator Cohen. Do you have further comments? Okay. Senator Champion, you're good. You know, I can go all day on this okay. question, <laughs> so I'll just let the others go. Thank, th thank you so much for your consideration, yeah, thank Madam you. Chair. Senator Eaton. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my question, my first question is um, on housing. In my district, which we border North Minneapolis, I'm in Brooklyn Center, Brooklyn Park, and the housing, we have lots of affordable housing, but it's all taken. And so how, how do we address the um, growing needs for more housing? Um, I'm, I've glanced through your paper here on housing, and I'm a little confused as to how we get the, um, the market the housing market to to private market to actually develop more housing um, if nothing else to to lure the people in the affordable housing out of it <laughs> or whatever I mean do you have any ideas Mr. Uh, thank you Madam Chair uh, yes thank you Senator this is a complex problem and I'll try to I'll give you a, probably a too simple answer just in the spirit of time we know that there are folks who live in poverty, and there's not gonna be a market solution for folks, right? They, they have an income problem, and there's not gonna be a affordable housing by itself solution. Some form of government support will be necessary to help them have a place to live. But what about everybody else? What about folks who have jobs, who make a decent wage, who are still struggling to find a, you know, a decent place to live for them and for their family? This is where our research is really focused on, trying to understand you know, developers are in the business of making money. So if there are a group of families that live in your district, they have jobs, they work, they wanna pay a mortgage, why, we're trying to figure out why aren't developers saying, hey, you know what, I can make money building a unit that can meet this family's needs. Why is it that the minimum cost of a unit or a house has gotten so high that the economics just don't make sense for that developer or that family and what are the policy solutions that could lower that level? Because again, if you go back to, this is an extreme example, if you go back to the solar panel example, every one of these requirements that we layer on a new unit directly drives up the, the affordability level or the unaffordability level, and it directly affects working families and in many cases, the working poor. So we wanna categorize those, catalog them, and figure out how much of this is, have we done to ourselves? by driving up these costs, how many of those could you relax to try to make it so that the market can come in here? My broader point, and this is in your business, so you know this better than me, I'm skeptical that there's any amount of money that the state or the federal government can appropriate to meet all of our housing needs. So somehow, we have to find a way to get the market to work, because only the market can work at scale that can meet, hopefully, all of our needs or most of our needs, and that's what we're trying to understand. Madam Chair, Senator Eaton. So I was wondering if you had some examples um, specific to our region that um, are bringing up the cost of uh, 
construction of new housing. Well, I'll give you Mr. an example. Oh, excuse me, Madam Chair, thank you. I'll give you an example where I live. I live in a western suburb. I'm part of the problem. I live in Orno. We have very large minimum lot sizes. If you, if you add minim, large minimum lot sizes, if you add X number of car garage that's required, if you add this many different rooms, all of these different amenities, all of which feel good at the time, and you bundle them all together, and now you do it all around the metro, all of a sudden, it's the working poor that end up getting affected. And so, you know, if every, I'll give you a hypothetical example. If every community in the Twin Cities committed to doubling its density, so let's say my neighborhood went from two acre lots to one acre lots. If every community doubled its density, I'm not saying building a, a high rise complex in my neighborhood, everybody just doubled. That would be a profound increase in supply in and around the Twin Cities that would create many, many more options. So the families that are living in the affordable units in your neighborhood might say, hey, I'm gonna go move over there because that's an even nicer house that I can afford, opening up a spot for another family to then move into that one that they just vacated. <coughs> Senator Eaton. Um, I have another subject. I was, um, I have a grandson in a charter school and I'm wondering if you had any thoughts as to how we could do a better job of assessing the uh, success of charter schools and weeding out the ones that aren't doing so well. Mr. Keshwar. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. This is a really important topic. So this is something that I was shocked when I, I visited a lot of schools around the region and I visited some high performing charter schools in the Twin Cities and I asked them, I said, what's your waiting list? And they said, we don't have a waiting list. How can that be? So many kids are stuck in schools that are underperforming and yet there are some very high performing charter schools that don't have waiting lists. What I learned was that families are confused because they've heard the anecdote that on average, charters don't do as well as traditional public schools. Well, that's because in Minnesota, with all due respect, we're Minnesota nice, and we don't shut down bad charter schools. And I, I would urge us to be, at the end of the day, we should be analytical and rigorous. If a school is not meeting the needs of its students, then either the management should be changed or the school should be shut down, and that should include charter schools. And if we had a much more aggressive policy in assessing how these charters are performing, and shutting down the ones that are not doing a good job, then the money and the kids are gonna to flow to the better performing schools, which is what they should. You know, in New York, the Success Academy schools, which are very high performing charter schools, they apparently have a six to one waiting list. There's such demand from moms and dads to send their kids to that school. They've got a huge waiting list. In some sense, that's a sign of a healthy charter network because parents have the information to make good decisions. Today, it's very hard for parents to know because there's so many schools around and we're not very tough on the ones that are underperforming. And to that point, um, Mr. Kashkari, Senator Nelson is the chair of K-12. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Chair, and, and thank you for addressing our charter schools. Um, we were the state that invented charter schools and they've been highly successful and we have seen some that have 95% um, have kids, at-risk kids, I've been to those schools, all those kids graduate, uh, they go on to higher education of some form and, and they do a great job. And we want that opportunity for all our kids, whether they're in charter schools or more traditional public schools or, uh, or other choice schools or, or private schools. We want all of our kids to have that option. The one, and we have followed this uh, charter school uh, wanting to uh, have low performing charter schools um, no longer be low performing, either because they improved dramatically or they're no longer in existence. The one area that we haven't discussed though is the charter schools that are serving the kids who have already dropped out. Serving, uh, I would call those recovery charter schools, and I don't mean in the sense of substance abuse, I mean it's a credit recovery charter school. So while those charter schools might be low performing, uh, they are, working with students who were no longer performing at all because they had dropped out either uh, physically or mentally from their more traditional school. And I would be very interested if uh, 
to visit with you either here if you if you have some ideas or offline about how we can uh, keep those charter schools that are seemingly low performing but they are credit recovery schools as opposed to those charter schools that are low performing uh, with with uh, students who are not in a credit recovery mode. Mr. Kishkar. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. You're exactly right, Senator. And as we and, and as my staff has dug into the data, you see it. You see some outliers. And when you dig into wait, why are these schools performing the way they are, there are special circumstances in some cases. And so absolutely, our assessment needs to be robust enough mm -hmm. to take a, into account those special situations, but also not let the just the low performing normal charter schools go by. Uh, so I'm with you, and I think this is something I'd be very pleased to follow up with you offline because this is something uh, we want to dig into deeper. Thank you. Senator Western, you have been very patient. Thank you so much. That's all right, Madam Chair. Uh, <laughs> very engaging, and so uh, it's all been quite interesting to listen to, uh, Mr. Kashkari. Uh, two, two topics that we've been talking, others have been talking about, but I'd like to uh, drill down just a little bit more or at least share the information with you. Uh, uh, under our finance committee, uh, we also have the housing finance, which uh, Senator Eaton and uh, others here have talked about the housing costs. Uh, recently, um, We've had a report uh, done by groups interested in affordable housing, uh, builders, and what is driving the costs. And um, not necessarily to everybody's shock and surprise, but, but to a lot of people's shock and surprise, uh, the cost of uh, building houses here in Minnesota um, is the highest in the region, and there's even comparisons to suburb Chicago, where our houses are fifty and eighty thousand dollars more to build the exact same type of house. And uh, in many cases, our, the conclusion was uh, housing is at least thirty thousand dollars higher when you start comparing uh, similar uh, regulatory costs, building codes, and uh, other things. And so, uh, that, that's a very troubling statistic and a troubling trend we're on and um, we're trying to get to the bottom of it because obviously uh, building codes and uh, regulations uh, often are put in place to you know cure something present pr preserve something prevent something um, but it all does come at a cost and uh, everything from uh, air handling systems uh, and uh, new radon uh, test uh, requirements uh, uh, insulation, uh, the list just goes on and on and on. And so we are trying to look at that and saying, what could we pare back or what could we do to give more flexibility to the homeowner, to the end user or the uh, builder developer? Uh, because maybe there are a lot of nice things, but there's a lot of things in the first house I lived in that I put up with because I could afford to get into that house. Uh, but it made me want to uh, eventually have an attached garage, eventually have uh, better uh, windows or better you name it. And so uh, I just offer this as some insight and some uh, uh, issue for comment uh, as, you, as you've talked about. But um, yesterday uh, we had realtors coming through uh, meeting with us and uh, talking about uh, in 1972 our building code was seven pages long. It's now 700 pages long. And so I think that in part shows us some of the areas we've talked about. You just touched on it with uh, local regulations. And that's part of what we are also uh, scratching our head and saying, you know, uh, how do local regulations uh, drive up costs? And uh, they certainly have a role in that. And so um, it is something we're, we're trying to wrestle with here. I just leave it at that. and. In, be interested in just any feedback or comments you have on on those aspects that we are looking at as ways to br bring down costs in the first home ownership opportunity for people uh, shouldn't be the most expensive one in the region. Mr. Kashkari. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Senator. I, I think you're focused on exactly the right issues. I'll give you an anecdote. A year ago or so, I was traveling the region and I was visiting a manufacturer in Duluth mm -hmm. and they just hired a new CFO. And the CFO was complaining about how expensive Duluth was relative to where he moved from, how expensive the housing was. And I asked him, I said, where'd you move from? I assumed it was some small town. He moved from Houston. 
if Duluth is a lot more expensive than Houston, Houston, we're doing something wrong. <laughs> and you know, we need to take a hard look in the mirror because yeah. although I love our weather, I wish every month was like February of 2019. <laughs> Not everybody does. And so we don't have the warm weather to attract people to us. And so if we are unaffordable relative to other parts of the country, we're gonna be at a competitive economic disadvantage. And so I do think that you're right to focus on these issues, and that's why we're focused on it. And again, if, we, if there's some way for us to partner or work together to be a resource for you, we absolutely want to be, because it's a huge issue. Okay, and, and yeah. to that end, yes, uh, Madam Chair, Westbrook. and uh, if, if there is anything that comes to mind that your staff has or is working on, we'd certainly uh, welcome uh, sharing that with our committee uh, administrator and our, our staff, and we can follow up on that. Um, but I appreciate your comments. Uh, Madam Chair, if I could just pivot to one more topic. Absolutely. Uh, disabilities and uh, your comments earlier. Uh, as somebody who lives with a disability, myself, um, it's quite near and dear your comments that uh, you, you made about uh, people standing on the sideline. And uh, I appreciate uh, your perspective or your thought, but um, and, and the issue uh, that you mentioned is how we used to treat people with disabilities Essentially, the test uh, to get on disability was you had to prove that you could not contribute to the economy, uh, which is such an archaic way of deciding if somebody is disabled because there is hardly a disability out there that somebody can't contribute some part to the economy. Uh, certainly, working full-time for some might not be as easy or as uh, uh, logical or likely as others but certainly part-time, and it brings the dignity and the gratification and the ability to have their own American dream. And so uh, any comments you have on what we could do to help change that, because I look at the great low unemployment as such an opportunity right now. Uh, Senator Champion talked about uh, some in the African-American community that has higher unemployment rates than, than the typical, uh, the typical unemployment rates, disability, uh, folks with a, living with a disability, uh, they have even a higher unemployment rate. And those groups, uh, it's such an opportunity right now for uh, employers and everybody involved in that employment uh, scale and the jobs that are created to relook at what can they do to bring those people into uh, the workforce, the labor force, and so I see this low unemployment as a tremendous opportunity for changing that paradigm of somebody with a disability is not unable to contribute to the economy, uh, but we might need to change our thinking about it and change uh, maybe, maybe a 20 or 30 hour a week uh, position is the way that you accommodate that, or maybe it's just some reasonable accommodations and that person can flourish with a 40 or 50 hour a week like anybody else. And so uh, I, I just wanted to comment on your comments, but also interested in your feedback of how do we continue bringing those people off the sidelines because there is an American dream that they can achieve but we have to change the paradigm and I think we've got the opportunity and frankly I think it's been changing for 10 or 20 years but this might be the the catalyst to really make that change happen. Mr. Uh, thank you Madam Chair. Uh, Senator I, I could not agree with you more. You know my, my comments previously were too brief. I talked about people on disability choosing to get off disability because the economy is stronger and wages are picking up. It's also businesses saying, you know what, we have to work harder to find workers and making accommodations that maybe a couple years ago they didn't feel like making. But now they said, well, you know what, we're gonna make them, and wow, we're finding all these workers that we hadn't previously considered. So it's, it is not only Americans with disabilities, you also have people with criminal backgrounds for some jobs that previously had not been considered. Now employers are saying, you know what, we're gonna give these folks a chance. People with previous, for example, substance abuse issues, employers giving them a chance. This is happening across the economy and it is resoundingly positive. So I don't know if there's an, from my perspective as a monetary policymaker, the best thing we can do is keep the expansion going, keep the job market continuing to strengthen, to draw more and more people back in. It's good for them, it's good for the businesses. Uh, for a legislature, I'm not sure if there's a specific policy that you need to pick up right now. Uh, I'm gonna do my part not to screw it up 
and raise rates unnecessarily. That could end the expansion. I'm doing everything I can to try to avoid that outcome. Now, the downside, so that's all good news. The concerning part is we do know expansions eventually end. And when recessions happen, it tends to be the last worker that was hired is the first one to let go. And so the, the concerning piece of this is if we are bringing in people with some disabilities back into the workforce, they're becoming productive, I just really hope they're not the first ones who end up getting turned out if the economy turns down. And so I don't have a solution for that, but that is something that I'm concerned about. But I would rather give everybody a chance to work, to prove themselves, to make a contribution, and then see what happens when the economy turns down. Senator Wester. And, and Madam Chair, uh, last comment, but uh, I think you hit a nail on the head, uh, Mr. Kashkari. Uh, uh, in previous, previously, I sat on the on federal ticket to work panel uh, uh, appointed by uh, President Bush, and uh, there was 12 of us that wrestled with this exact issue. And the ticket to work uh, was legislation that passed bipartisanly 99 to 0 uh, back in the 90s with that exact issue. But one of the things we wrestled with, and it is a policy making decision, but we need to be sensitive to it, is to not have that cash cliff as you kind of identified. Uh, both if you go back to work and it doesn't work uh, for whatever reason, uh, there needs to be a quick rejoining of those uh, supports that you were having until you can find that next opportunity in employment. And so that was one of the things we, we wrestled with. Uh, uh, to my chagrin, the, that, that ticket to work legislation has been lackluster at best, but uh, I think it's, there's been many uh, positive uh, uh, principles that that uh, legislation has, and uh, I think we still uh, have that opportunity because uh, most everybody, uh, Democrat appointed, Republican appointed, uh, just uh, advocates in the community, uh, I think every one of us agreed to the last person that the ultimate objective is you have to raise expectations of people with a disability, but give them the opportunities to work. And uh, that's one of the issues that we have to deal with, with policies so we can encourage work. Senator Kiffmeyer. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, really interesting discussion, all the comments, and also with your expertise and background, just really helpful to have that from you as well. Uh, just was going to mention that right now, my understanding is we have the lowest unemployment amongst minority communities, African American and Hispanic, in the history of the United States. However, it is still way above in the uh, white community. And so when I look at a target-rich environment, at which there are workers on the sidelines that can be engaged. I think the things that you mentioned are definitely, and I think that's really good news for them, but how to do that. The question I have for you is, on Minnesota, we just had our uh, February forecast. So this is getting a little bit more into the Minnesota side. And instead of a $1.54 billion surplus, we're a little over $1 billion. Personal income taxes revenues were down sales tax revenues were down, but corporate income taxes revenue went up. And so that was the effect in the bigger things in regards to that, which of course affects us directly in our budget. Could you just comment, is that similar to other states in the country, similar to our region? Could you comment on what that means for us in our budgeting here in Minnesota? Thank you, Senator Kipmaver. That was gonna be my last comment also, is uh, words of wisdom from Mr. Kashkari. Well, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, Senator, unfortunately, I don't have a view of the Minnesota budget forecast and the relative tax. We don't, we do state level budgeting and whether it's personal income tax or corporate taxes. I think overall, the outlook for the U.S. economy is continued growth. You know, we're not forecasting a recession on the horizon, but we're also not seeing a big economic growth spurt either. It's more of a you know, modest growth environment that we feel like we're in right now. So I, I'm afraid I'm not in a position to give you a more specific answer to your very thoughtful question than that. Um, but I, I imagine the, the staff that prepares your budget forecast are very good at preparing the Minnesota outlook. Uh, so I would respectfully defer to them. Okay, thank you. Senator Nelson. Oh, uh, thank you, Madam Chair. 
Uh, Mr. Keshkari, I, I just want to thank you so much for your focus on uh, the importance of education in, in all of the issues that are so important to um, our economic growth, closing achievement gaps, health disparities, affordable housing, all of those things. But there's one thing we didn't talk about today that I noticed on your sheet here, which I just love, ending too big to fail. <laughs> so I love that hashtag. Um, now, I just have uh, two brief questions about that. One, I notice uh, that um, you are calling to increase capital requirements on our larger banks, uh, reduce them on our smaller, what I would assume our community banks. We cannot thank you enough. Uh, those uh, high capital requirements are strangling our community banks. And um, I believe that we're gonna, we talk about the difference between rural Minnesota and suburban Minnesota and metro Minnesota. And I believe that we can have and will have a real rural renaissance if we have three things. One of them is community banks. Second is great education, and the third is high-speed internet. And so I just, uh, if you have a moment to talk more about that, but I, I'm just thrilled that you've, you've taken note of the strangling uh, that has happened with our community banks because of these large regulations. Mr. Kajikari. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and thank you, Senator, for bringing up Too Big to Fail. Uh, one of the first things that I did after joining the Minneapolis Fed is work with our colleagues to look at the issue of Too Big to Fail banks and the financial crisis that hammered the U.S. economy in 08. And the bottom line is the biggest banks in America are still too big to fail. And remarkably, they have less capital, less of a buffer to protect against bad things than small banks. It should be the opposite. Small banks are not at risk of bringing down the U.S. economy, and yet they have more reserves than the biggest banks. And so that's backwards. So we've been advocating as loudly as we can. Um, I think right now the regulatory winds are blowing against us. We're more in a deregulatory mode in Washington than in more regulations for the biggest banks. But we're going to continue to advocate for this simply because, you know, when I was in Washington from 06 to 09, I was the guy in charge of the bank bailout. It was the right thing to do. We didn't want to let the U.S. economy collapse, but we never, ever, ever want to do that again. And the way we prevent that from happening again is making sure the biggest banks in America have enough actual capital, skin in the game, so they can deal with their own losses, not have to turn to the taxpayers. Senator Nelson. Um, so with that in mind, with the regulatory environment now, um, would there be any harm in just um, reducing the over-regulatory nature of the uh, capital uh, requirement for our community banks? While the, there might not be a successful time to increase regulation on those big banks, what about just unleashing our community banks uh, through lowering that capital requirement? Mr. Well, Madam Chair and Senator, there was a, um, what's called the Crapo bill, there was a bill passed by, in Washington last spring that was, I would say, marketed as community bank reform. It seemed to provide most of the relief to very large super regional banks with some relaxation for community banks. Uh, could we do more for community banks? I think we probably could. Uh, but one thing we're nervous about is you know, all of a sudden the big banks are going to be asking for their relief because everybody else got their relief. So I think politically it's a complex issue, but I think all the regulators that I have talked to have heard the message. We know that community banks, you know, one of the perverse things of the new regulations, they are trying to address the biggest banks, but they actually made the advantages for the big banks bigger because it's easier for them to hire a couple more compliance officers than it is for a little community bank to hire a couple more compliance officers. So again, there's unintended consequences can happen. And I think a lot of regulators across the Federal Reserve and across the country are focused on trying to get it right for community banks. But I hope, do, I hope we could do more for the big banks. And Senator Kipmar. Just a quick question, Mr. Kashkari. Um, it was on my list, but I didn't want to take too much more time from no, others. Um, responding to um, some of the commodities that you have the span here, if you have gold, silver, strong dollar, euro, you have the Brexit, you have all this span that's going on. Just in regard, you address a little bit the monetary policy, but I'm just kind of asking you to look at a little bit in that strata if you might comment on that. Mr. Kashkari. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, we pay, the, some of the things you talked about, say Europe, the challenges in Europe, Brexit, China, these are big macroeconomic risks that we pay attention to around the world that if they were to go down a bad path would be big enough potentially to affect the U.S. economy. So we're always looking for what could tip us over. Some things are our own control, some things are out of our control. So Brexit and ultimately where the Eurozone goes 
I mean, the Europe is a huge economy, enormously important to the U.S. economy. There are big political challenges in Europe that are as yet unaddressed. So something we're paying attention to can't influence it. Don't see any crisis on the immediate horizon, but we have to keep watching. Similarly, China is slowing down quite a lot. They've been a big engine for global economic growth over the last decade. As China slows down, now the U.S. has to be more of the engine to carry that load because China's not contributing as much. That's something we're also paying a lot of attention to. And I touched on earlier tariffs. There's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen with the trade battles that are going on between the U.S. and China. Are they going to be resolved amicably? Are they going to get much worse? Again, I can't forecast that, but it's something that we pay a lot of attention to and that will ha could have big impact on the U.S. economy. Mr. Kashkari, do you do much with public pensions? Uh, Madam Chair, not a lot. I mean, we have people around the system who I know have studied it, but I personally haven't spent a lot of time on public pensions. Mm -hmm. Though I am, I am on the committee that oversees the Federal Reserve's pension, so I'm familiar with pension issues. But uh, what, is there something specific you're getting at? I'm just at? wondering how, if, if you have done any study to see how that the reforms, if, if it drives, really does drive the state economy and, and uh, the health of the, uh, the state economy. Well, I, let me come back to you on that. I mean, I know that the, some of the states, Illinois as an example, where which are off the charts in terms of their underfunded pensions, or individual cities like Detroit, it does have, it can have profound economic consequences because it just crowds out all the investment that they want to make in other things, such as education, police, et cetera. So they can be very, very big issues. Um, but more broad than that, I don't have any comments at the, at the okay. moment. Well, with that, um, I just to, before you get to your closing comments, Mr. Kashkari, again, I want to thank you so much for coming here. I'd like to thank Brian Perrell, my committee assistant, for, for thinking of this, to, to bring you here to develop this relationship and uh, this correspondence that we'll have ongoing. And he actually took a tour, members of the Federal Reserve. I didn't know you could take a tour. <laughs> that would be actually fascinating. So, um, excuse me. Yeah. Oh, you guys did it together? Oh, it was good. <laughs> okay. um, it does sound like a field trip, exactly. So uh, with that, I, I really want to thank you. Any, any final comments, Ms. Kashgari? I just want to make sure that we continue to collaborate um, and um, look forward to some of your research that you have coming out. Well, well, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, members of the committee and staff. I really appreciate it. This is a great opportunity for us. I think there are a lot of issues that we can work on together, right. and I uh, hope you will look to us as a resource. We are a non-political, non-partisan agency that's always going to lead with our best analysis, and that's our commitment to you and to all of the American people. So please do look to us. And if you would like to come for a tour, and we'd love to host the committee or any of the members of the committee, please do. Uh, we'd be very pleased to do that and introduce you to more of our staff who are doing the actual research. I'm just the person talking to you, but behind me are a thousand people who are doing the hard work every day that I'd love to introduce you to them. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity, Madam Chair. Absolutely, thank you. We have a wonderful resource right down the street. Uh, members, with that, we have a, a hearing tomorrow. We're gonna do reinsurance and a mortgage finance bill with Senator Dames. No further questions. The committee is adjourned. Thank you.